Hello, book burners, and welcome to another episode of Books Are Burning. I'm your host, Mark Will, author, songwriter, and publisher in permanent exile, currently based on the island of Taiwan. And with me today, once again, is my sometime co-author, G.J. Via. G.J. Via and I are writing the Aaron-esque series of novelettes. Here is volume one right here. It's called Flans Day. And volume two, Wilds Day, will be coming out later this year. Get your copy of Flans Day now so that you're ready for Wilds Day when it comes out. Now today we will be discussing Cormac McCarthy's The Passenger. And uh, here is the great man himself, Cormac McCarthy, born Charlie McCarthy or Charles McCarthy. But of course, uh, he takes the name of a famous Irish king or chieftain, King Cormac. Born 1933, he died last year, 2023. And he is one of the great American novelists, I think it's safe to say. Um, let's talk about those novels that he's famous for. I think you and I both um, started reading Mr. McCarthy at the same time. It was early in the early 2000s. Our reading group, the Houston Joy Society, started with Blood Meridian. It was pretty pretty intense experience. Yeah, um, so yeah, it, we started with Blood Meridian. Is it safe to say that after reading that, he became one of your literary masters? I mean, that would be the case for me. I I actually didn't expect much. You know, I thought, why am I reading? a western mm. i mean is that is that is that what this is like that's not really a genre that i'm interested in but um while uh, reading it i realized this is truly a great this is a literary masterpiece oh yeah i mean it's undeniable the the, the language was hypnotic <clears throat> had to sort of read with a dictionary in hand his his vocabulary is so far far ranging his depiction of the landscapes um graham wood in an interview uh of the passenger and stella maris uh, characterizes blood meridian um uh, said it's a <laughs> contest among humanoid creatures so violent and warlike that they might be gods and demons a western gutter damarung which i think is a pretty good encapsulation of what's what it's all about that was a fascinating read it certainly i knew it was an unique right um I, nothing like i'd read before it's sort of redefining of the western in some ways or taking the western to its most violent extremes and it's, it's about among well other i think things, uh, i think harold manifest destiny and i think harold bloom said after blood meridian there's really no point in anyone writing another western right like he mccarthy did everything that can be done with the with the genre well he's at least sort of a simple evocation of heroes and villains right those categories don't really exist in that amoral blood-drenched universe but yeah so we started with blood meridian um i've read a couple of his earlier books those i guess those early southern gothic books the first three um Sutri, uh, I still need to read the uh, Border Trilogy, but from uh, No Country On, I've read everything and been really, really impressed. Just finished Stella Maris, in fact. I've got the Border Trilogy right here. Yeah. Quite a thick tome. We'll have you to read that. that. We'll have to do that for sure. But that's, Yeah, we'll that's, have to read that uh, soon. Considering that that's when people think about his taking on of the Western genre, that's what comes to mind i think before maybe blood meridian in the popular imagination at least. so you finished stella morris i did yeah okay it's a definitely a worthy coda to this right these final two books 
All right. Well, as we say, our focus today is the passenger, the passenger and Stella Morris or uh, companion volume, sometimes called a duology, just as all the pretty horses, the crossing and cities of the plain are the border trilogy. Uh, the passenger and Stella Morris are called the duology of the Western family. At least that's what Wikipedia says. Um, now, we should point out that several of these novels have been made into films. Of course, probably the best of these is the Coen Brothers, No Country for Old Men. Um, I thought The Road was okay. I haven't seen the Matt Damon, uh, Penelope Cruz uh, film, yeah. All the Pretty Horses. Have you? No. Yeah. Um, now he he also uh wrote some screenplays. He didn't write the screenplays for those well-known films based on his books, but he did write a couple of other screenplays. For example, The Counselor, which uh most people didn't like, but I quite enjoyed. Did you see that? I haven't seen either of those two. I know he wrote those, but have not seen them. I recommend The Counselor. I, I think it's it's pretty good. And then The Sunset Limited is based on a play that he wrote. And uh, it was made into a film uh, directed by Tommy Lee Jones and starring Tommy, Tommy Lee Jones and Samuel L. Jackson as the characters You've White and Black. What's that? You've seen that? Yeah. I, I recommend it. I think it's good. I mean, it's not his greatest work, but it's worth watching. So, all right, let's get into the passenger. Um, when we think about this novel, and we ask ourselves what the plot is, you know, we might uh, end up saying what plot because it doesn't really seem to follow the typical pattern of exposition, rising action, conflict, climax, denouement, and resolution. I mean, is there a plot at all? What would you say? Uh, no, not in the traditional sense. So if you take No Country for Old Men, which I'm sure some of our listeners have seen, probably read, that has a fairly straightforward plot easier certainly to make something like that into a movie i i can't imagine a movie version of the passenger um simply because it really doesn't have a plot so much it's bobby western early 80s living in the shadow of his grief for his beloved sister who committed suicide 10 years earlier um, and there's a whole heap of characters with whom he interacts um, Characters who not just doing up monologuing for the most part, right? Um, uh, and it has a multiplicity of settings. It's got a, an opening that suggests it's going to be a kind of detective noir, but that really is just a kind of red herring, you know. That's the MacGuffin at the beginning, the, you know, with the whole passenger and whether the passenger's missing, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so I suppose it's. Um, kind of philosophical novel in some ways, looking at love, death, guilt, illusion um, through the character of Bobby Western and his interactions with a variety of characters. And then we have the interspersed scenes, uh, flashbacks to uh, his sister um, and her hallucinations with the thalidomide kid. Um, so it's kind of a sp glorious, sprawling mess, right? Um, and yet there's a, certainly I would say, a thematic cohesion cohesions that hold it together but yeah there's no plot i mean it's hard for me to imagine a, a movie version of this book philosophical novel is a good description and as you say it's very much character driven the characters reveal themselves mostly through i would say hemingway-esque dialogue but uh we'll get to that a bit later let's first and but just to follow up on that point, that's that makes it unlike, say, a book like Blood Meridian, in which there's very little dialogue, right? And characters 
Uh, this has just a, an abundance of dialogue. And, and again, a lot of the dialogue ends up a character speaking at length in these long paragraphs. That's something new in McCarthy, at least from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, even if there's no plot necessarily, there's kind of a running theme of the passenger. So let's ask ourselves, who or what is the passenger of the title? I mean, what are we talking about? If we look at the the back cover of the book, which I have here, mm -hmm. um, if you look, yeah, if you if you look at is. the back cover, there's a, a blurb, and uh, we get this description: Past Christian, Mississippi, 1980. It is three in the morning when Bobby Western zips up the jacket of his wetsuit and plunges from a Coast Guard tender into darkness. His dive light illuminates the sunken jet. Nine bodies still buckled into their seats. Missing from the crash site are the pilot's flight bag, the plane's black box, and the tenth passenger. So reading just the back cover, we assume that it is this tenth passenger that is the passenger of the title but are we correct in in thinking that or is that is that like the only meaning of the passenger well that's what i meant about the kind of red herrings that that's the MacGuffin that starts the plot and you think it's going to be an unraveling of a mystery who is the 10th passenger right? uh, will bobby western be a kind of <clears throat> detective-like character um, who unravels some sort of plot, you know, uh, that explains what, who this passenger was, how he could possibly have been missing. Um, of course, you know, if that's what you're looking for, that's not the novel you're going to get, right? Um, so in terms of who this passenger is, we never... This is a mystery that is unresolved, right? Um, when Western salvage dives with his friend Euler down into this sunken jet. It's never clear who hired him to do this, right? It's, um, he's been hired to go check out this sunken jet. Um, uh, they don't know how that 10th passenger could have been taken out of the sunken jet, right? Because the, there's no indication of the plane having been broken into in any, any case. So what we get at the very beginning of the novel is a, mystery that is unresolved and unresolvable and i guess that's where it veers away from a plot driven novel right um, it's, it's it's thematic right um, this idea of a lost soul a lost passenger an unknown person um, and for me you know um that seems to be perhaps emblematic of bobby western and his own lostness if you will right um, and there's various references to passengers and uh, traveling and so on and uh, throughout the novel. So, in short, it's a, a you know of symbolic and thematic importance rather than something that's going to be resolved on level of plot. Well, we'll we'll get into those different meanings of passenger, but I would just say there is a kind of narrative thread there. You know, it, uh, uh, Western does go in search of this passenger um as you say he ends up lost in a sense and and nothing is resolved i mean in this as i think i mentioned to you in a text he he reminds me of uh llewellyn moss um from no country for old men it's just a kind of every man character that's like in over his head um there are forces that he doesn't understand and it would probably be best for him to not investigate like it's it's not in his interest to look into these uh, mysteries it, it, it would be better for him if he would leave well enough alone but he well, he still feels this compulsion to you know search for answers and it's and it's not clear why you know why would why would the identity of the passenger, the missing passenger, be of importance to him? He does 
go looking in the first hundred. There's a scene where he rents a boat, a yellow two man rubber raft to go looking at the various sort of estuaries and islands um, around that area, trying to find, look for traces of the lost passenger. But after that, and that's only a hundred pages into this almost whatever, 400 page book, the search for the passenger, the literal passenger is over, right? So it's not as if he spends the entire book looking to try to uncover this, right? Um, he, he figures out, the more important is the paranoia it induces and that becomes certainly a kind of theme that is developed, right? Um, who is coming after me? Strange figures start ransacking his apartment. Federal agents and the IRS start to track him down, right? So you have this sense that this lost passenger is somehow related to the surveillance that he finds himself under, right? And that surveillance may or may not be related to his dead father's contribution to, uh, you know, the Manhattan Project, right? So you have all of this kind of these web of conspiracies and paranoias and so on. Um, and I guess in that sense, the book becomes a little bit Kafkaesque, even Pinchonian, right? Well, yeah, I was just about to say, with the paranoia and the conspiracy, it's, I, I would say it's by far the most Pynchon-esque and Kafka-esque of, of McCarthy's works. Yeah, Pynchon without um, the wacky humor. <laughs> without the uh, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, maybe it's more Kafka-esque because it's, it's dark and no answers are given. There's no right. resolution. Um, no tidy endings. I mean, not that there is in pension either, but right. All right. Well, let's look at some of those, uh, examples of passenger in the text. So the earliest referenced I found is on page 21. He's talking to, um, I think he's talking to those mysterious um gentlemen in suits men in black as it were from who knows where the fbi it's not clear but he says seven passengers plus the pilot and co-pilot nine in all this is what he or, or he actually is, he may be talking to euler here but this is this mm -hmm. is what they see at the actual site of the wreckage, right? Seven right. plus the pilot and co-pilot, nine. Nine bodies, basically. And then he's told later by these uh, men in black, well, apparently there should have been eight passengers. They explained that there were eight listed on the manifest, to which he says, FAA regulations require a stewardess on all commercial flights of more than seven passengers. Um, so he he's thinking that, uh, you know, if there were 10 people, it would be seven plus stewardess plus pilot and co-pilot. That would be 10, right? But then they explained to him it was not a... Con commercial flight but rather a charter flight right do i have that well, right yeah i mean we can look at all these references one by one but i mean the point is like i mean if you look at the page numbers there's one that, that pops up at 272 283 again these ongoing references to the lost passenger right that's going to recur throughout the book and then there are other references to passengers in the alicia western uh <coughs> chapters um the i guess what are they flashbacks i suppose right uh, of her time hallucinating with this thalidomide kid so the passenger thing is a mystery right um you know uh it's it's unresolved um it's symbolic right uh uh and it is going to be a book with a lot of unresolved strands right and that's the well but we on, we do on McCarthy's part. We do get a a clue that, you know, maybe this 10th passenger somehow escaped from the wreckage. I, how, how do you think that would have happened? I mean, here on page 61, by the time he got to the marina, he thought that the man who'd gone ashore on the island was almost certainly the passenger. As we say, he goes exploring on his own time and 
on his own dime for reasons unknown. There's just yeah. that obsessiveness. There's, I don't know, it's almost like a, a Melvillian um, search for the white whale. Like, what? what's the point of it? It's It can only lead to ruin, but nevertheless, he, he goes searching for the the holy grail of the tenth passenger so do you think i mean how do we read that is that is that who it was there there was someone whose whose what footprints he saw on the island that's the tenth passenger does it matter i mean to me the point is you can't have answers to those questions and mccarthy has constructed his novel in a way that you'll never have a definitive answer Moby Dick, the payoff at the end is you actually get to see the white whale, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a figure of fact rather than a figure of speculation and paranoia. Um, uh, again, for me, the more important thing is uh, here is one of these mysteries, and I don't think it's the only one in the novel, that will not be and can't be resolved, right? And so maybe that is a part of the human condition or just something that plagues Western, right? Um, and he has to live with that unresolvedness. Well, but he he doesn't he doesn't let it go, you know. Even much later in the book, page two seventy two, he says he thought about the passenger, but he never went back out to the islands. He knew that he should wonder what was to become of him. So that comes into his consciousness, but that that it's you know uh, that is not his obsession from page sixty one to two seventy two. This book is not about his obsession with who the passenger is. Um, it's an ongoing thought that comes to him from time to time, but, you know, other paranoias have emerged by them, right? Who is following him? Who did Euler get killed, right? Um, uh, and then, of course, the biggest mystery is this mystery of the quasi-incestuous relationship with the sister right? and his ongoing grief about her. All right, well, one last quote here. Um, with the word passengers. In the spring of the year, birds began to arrive on the beach from across the gulf. He walked the beach with his flashlight the whole of the night to fend away predators, and toward the dawn he slept with them in the sand. That none disturbed these passengers. He's talking about the birds? How do you read I think, that? I think so. Yeah. Birds as passengers, things that travel as passengers. I mean, if you unpack passenger, a passenger is someone who's not the pilot, right? A passenger is along for the ride, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, to what extent is Western along for some sort of ride that he's not fully in control of, right? Um, does he really have a plan in terms of his life? Not really, right? He's kind of a ne'er-do-well. It, it's sort of a darker version. Not that Sutri wasn't dark, but the novel Sutri right, which takes place uh, in the South, right, and the title character has a whole host of these ne'er-do-wells kind of living off the grid that he interacts with. There's certainly some of that here, right, uh, Western, mm -hmm. um, all his ne'er-do-well friends, um, uh, Western doesn't really have, yeah, he does, he's a salvage diver, but he's he's certainly not a uh, a career man, right, he takes gigs as he gets them, right. Uh, he's along for the ride too like in and and all of his friends and associates and companions are right. as well they're just kind of right. drifting through life none is the pilot as you say right right but but then that raises the question is anyone really a pilot or a co-pilot i mean right. are we not all passengers that certainly you know when it gets into the Alicia sections and her interactions with the kid and the the hallucinatory hallucinated kid who is mocking her, but also bringing up uh, issues of mathematical concepts, right, and quantum level sort of physics concepts about uncertainty and unreliability and so on, right? Those those ideas kind of intersect with this notion of maybe. I don't know, randomness, unknowability, these big philosophical notions that get injected into the novel. Well, let's get into that in a minute, but I, I want to push back a little bit on 
um, something you said. Basically, you're suggesting that after this initial interest in finding out about the passenger, he just lets go of it and and forgets about it, and it only occurs to him once or twice later. I think there's more to it than that, and I think it's connected to something that happened to him when he was a kid. Um, this is this occurs. This is a flashback. Well. I mean, it's a reference to a flashback. He's talking, this is Western here, talking to um, Klein. Um, and uh, he says, when I was 13, I found a wrecked airplane in the woods. And Klein says, you can read that part. Yeah. Uh, okay, you never told anyone? No. Was there anyone in the plane? Yes, the pilot. He was dead. Yes. So, you know, is this why the discovery of the wrecked plane at Christian Pass is of such interest to him? Like, the, what's the Certainly connection weirdly, between... Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, okay, so, yeah, it's, it's an unusual uh, coincidence, right, that there are these two wrecked planes right that bobby western discovers the first when he's 13 the second when he's a salvage diver much much later in life right uh i'm not sure what your question is though so we have these two wrecked planes right um, again all of this to me is operating on the level of symbol and theme the, the plot well there, i i'm just saying this is the beginning of his um, maybe obsession is too strong a word, but uh, interest in or or concern with the meaning of being a passenger versus a pilot. Yeah. Um, you know, if that's yeah. the distinction we're making, right. is anyone really a pilot? Like in the end, um, the pilot was dead right like what right. however he he may have thought he was in control but that turned out not to be the case he he too was simply a passenger in the end yeah and and that's a I think the way the only way we can kind of interpret these scenes scenes on this kind of larger thematic level <clears throat> of lack of human agency drifting the illusion of control at best right that seems to underscore and uh western's life doesn't it yeah i would say so and, and of course is his transparently to me bobby western right um the last name right um, mm -hmm. suggesting both the genre of the western which mccarthy has redefined in his own way as and well Western as of, Western civilization, of course. Western civilization, traveling west, you know, Western expansionism, right? All of those things are rolled in there, so. <clears throat> yeah. Well, okay, you alluded to this. Here we have um, an italicized dialogue, which, which indicates that this is Alicia, Bobby Western's sister, talking to the hallucinated thalidomide kid right so mm -hmm. here here is another meaning of passenger which uh i think is an interesting parallel so let's let's read uh let's take the various parts and read we came on the bus were there other people on the bus sure why not could they see you the other passengers yes who knows jesus probably some could and some couldn't well, what kind of passenger can you see? Can see you. Can see you, excuse me. How did we get stuck on this passenger thing? What kind of passenger is it that can see you? All right, and then the narrator interjects and said, The kid stuck what would have been his thumbs in his ear holes and waggled his flippers and rolled his eyes and went blabble, labble, labble. She put one hand over her mouth. 
And then the kid says, I'm just jacking with you. I don't know what kind of passenger. So he's basically saying that the passengers are insane, right? They're, it's it's kind of like this bus is a ship of fools. How do you like that? And Yeah, and to clarify for viewers, right, um, this is an exchange between Alicia Western and her hallucinated friend, the kid, the little yeah, kid. Her imaginary Jeez, friend. Who comes with a troop of other... What are they? A troop of... Freaks. Kind of freaks, circus-like freaks. And so she's wondering, how did you get here? That that happens in a few of her sections. She, how did you get here, right? Um, you know, uh, the answer is, we came on the bus. Okay, well, were well, there other people on the bus? This notion of passengers. Um, visitants, right? Uh, invaders, if you will. It's not fully clear what the passenger is doing there, what these dialogues mean, right? But well, it's just, I mean, it's, it's, a an, her. it's an existential allegory in a way, or a meditation on the problem of existence. How did any of us get here? Like, right. did we all come on the bus? Are we on a ship of fools? We're right. all passengers spinning around on this globe. Mm -hmm. so those are the questions that plague Alicia Western, especially. So you mentioned earlier that Bobby Western is a kind of everyman. In some ways he is, in some ways he's not, um, because these are also highly intelligent characters, if not genius. Like Alicia, right, uh, is a mathematical genius, um, mm -hmm. much more brilliant than even her very smart brother. Um, and then their father, right, was instrumental in the Manhattan Project, right, which just looms over this whole thing, right? The uh, atomic and nuclear warfare and the, the way that that shifts humanity in the 20th century, right? They're the children mm -hmm. of that kind of diabolical genius. Um, anyhow, um, a lot of the interaction with the kid has the kid talking about these ideas of uncertainty, unknowability, the, the philosophical notions that plague Alicia and, by extension, her brother, Bobby, right? So this passenger theme is, again, right? How did we get here, you're asking, right? Is this just a ship of fools, right? Do we know where we're going? Who is control of where we're going, right? Those are the questions that animate the novel. We're on a road to nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, then a bit later, the bus comes up again. Um, this time I'll be Alicia. So you're on the bus. Can we get off the fucking bus? You're on the bus, you and your fellow cohorts, and you talk. Sometimes. Maybe. Sure. Can they hear you? Is it co-passengers? Yes. Don't know. Can they hear you, yes or no? Like, do they butt in with an opinion? No, not like. Let me ask you a different question. Ask away. Are you taking dictation? Am I what? Taking dictation. Are you listening to someone? Is someone advising you? Holy shit, I only wish. You? No, I don't know. I wouldn't know how to make sense of such a thing. Yeah, me either. So this is interesting to me because why is she concerned with knowing whether or not there's someone to listen to, someone, someone from whom one could take dictation? Is it like... It seems to me she's asking, is there someone directing the passengers? Is there someone the passengers can listen to for guidance? Is that how you read it? Do the passengers come from some force outside of Alicia, or are they just projections of her own schizoid psyche? Yeah, and but more more broadly, you know, what about all the passengers of the world, right? Like it's both the passengers in her head, but it's also all of us, all of us passengers uh, in this world, right? Like, a, is there someone we can listen to? And, and both she and the kid seem to be resistant to that, right? right? I wouldn't know how to make sense of such a thing. Right, right, right. Is someone well, advising you? Like, no, there's nobody. 
How could you make sense of such a thing? It's all coming from within within you. And this reminds me of something that that another character, uh, W.C. Fields, says uh, maybe earlier in the novel, but we'll talk about that later. So it's, for later hallucinations, Alicia, as she interacts not with a kid, but Miss Vivian, um, one of the members of the freak show. And mm -hmm. the entire section is about Miss Vivian's concern about the babies, right? The babies don't know where they are. They don't know who to trust. They could be in the woods somewhere waiting for the wolves and they have this long talk about these. I guess that that's the first sort of first step of one's journey into the world, right? Being born into the world as a baby, a squalling, mewling, you know, terrified, shrieking baby, right? So the passenger theme is sort of continued in that hallucination, right? Um, um, our very first sort of entrance into the world is these um, helpless infants, right? Terrified, etc. Oh, so that yeah, reminds that me. When we are born... We cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. Oh, talked about the right. talked about the ship of fools right. earlier. Maybe it's a stage of fools. All the men and women merely players or passengers. Mm -hmm. It's getting deep. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the settings. So, of course, you know the as the back cover told us. One important setting is past Christian, Mississippi, the year 1980. It's soon after Hurricane Camille, which I remember quite well. Mm. Did you have to evacuate? I don't during remember that? if that's the one we didn't evacuate for or not. Um, yeah. Readers should know that Mark, Will, and I both grew up right outside of Houston, um, right there on the Gulf Coast. So, uh, this kind of geography and climate is very familiar to us. Yeah, this is our territory. And it's also it's also Faulkner country when we're getting into Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And of course, so we that's... started fast Christian and then the, we jump around a whole variety of settings. Yeah, well, uh, I've got a Google map here. It's not clear, but up here in the... Uh, upper right hand corner you can see past christian mm -hmm. and then if you go to the lower left hand corner you can see new orleans right so they're they're the you know western and his associates are basically living in new orleans but he goes out to past christian for this job that's where the wreckage uh the right. the site of the wrecked plane um is set but you know they they reside in new orleans louisiana so i guess that's the i guess that's if you had to say there's a primary setting that's where we are a good deal of the time right um but we're not there permanently and yeah it's established very early on that western rents a small apartment there he lives with a cat billy ray um he doesn't really have a permanent residence, so New Orleans is as close as it gets, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess if we if we take 1980 as the present uh, setting of the novel, then um, New Orleans would be the the place, right? If the time mm -hmm. is 1980, New Orleans is the place. So right. most of most of the novel would be set there i would say but of course there are some flashbacks to earlier times um oak ridge tennessee and tennessee of course is mccarthy country it's the setting of sutry and you know it's basically where he grew up but uh it's called the home of the manhattan project and of course also los alamos is another one of those homes mm -hmm. and as you mentioned before uh Bobby and Alicia Western's father was one of the scientists who worked with Oppenheimer and, you know, other um, scientists who are, are named in the book um, on building the atomic bomb. Right. And this is, you know, this is 
reflective of McCarthy's long-standing interest in science and scientists. He knows a lot about um, physics and, you know, basically all of those characters that we talked about uh, when we discussed when we cease to understand the world by Labatut, right? But really, I think all of those characters are mentioned at one time or another in the passenger. So that's a really nice intertextual connection. Yeah. Those and, who uh, have not read when we cease to understand the world will definitely want to do so. The mathematician Grotendieck is mentioned a lot by Alicia in Stella Maris. Mm, okay. She actually, she actually met him and um, you'll need to read the book and oh, quick, okay. quick follow up on that. But well, and I, I also remember that the Maserati that um, Western buys, I mean, he had this alternative life when he was like racing cars before he became like a the salvage two racer in Europe, salvage yeah. diver. But the, but the, uh, you know, the Trident logo he associated with Schrodinger's uh, wave, wave function, function, right? Right, right, right. All right, so have? yeah, let's move through the settings. Perhaps you know of equal importance to New Orleans is Stella Maris, which is located in Black River Falls, Wisconsin. Now, Stella Maris, of course, as we said, it's the title of the second volume of this duology. It means literally in Latin, "star of the sea," and this is an epithet of the Virgin Mary. So it's a, eh, I don't know. I, I feel like there's significance to these names, right? Like this is On a the fictional. Level, it's the name. And the literal level is the name of the asylum. Where... Yeah. But this is, I mean, it's a fictional place. There, there is no such place in Black River Falls, Wisconsin that yeah. I, that I know of. I think that's McCarthy's invention, but you know, come on, why did he pick that name? Like the, it's a, you assume it's like a Catholic run charity mental hospital or something, but just like the name Christian pass, there, there seems to be allegorical significance to that. But, um, had you heard well, about say, this? Go ahead. I would say it's Stella Maris with, you know, the allusion to the Virgin Mary, right? That's, we're thinking about Alicia Western, um, and her lifelong love for her brother, which she's never consummated. Um, uh, so in that sense, she is sort of like a virginal figure, if you will, right? Um, and she's also someone whom Bobby worships throughout this book. Bobby is, yeah. this is his lost, profound love, right? Um, I think those are some of the possible meanings behind that. Well, she's also, I mean, if we're associating her with Mary, you know, she's also kind of a mater dolorosa, like a, you know, mother, a dolorous mother, a woman of sorrows, woman as suffering machine, mm -hmm. as Picasso yeah. would say, you know, right, even right, though right. she's not, she's not maternal, um, except in a way, maybe she is in that she engenders all these hallucinations hallucinatory characters right so right. Th maybe the the thalidomide kid is her child right that's her baby jesus mm -hmm. Ooh, it's getting deep <laughs> had you heard about this wisconsin death trip black river no. falls wisconsin is the site of these very strange uh happenings there's a book about all of these bizarre I don't know, murders and suicides that occurred in Black River Falls. So I think that's probably why he set Stella Maris there. I had no idea. I'll look into that. Cool. Um, okay, and then the last setting we'll mention is Formentera, Spain. This is a, uh, I don't, yeah, is it an autonomous region, kind of like uh, Ceuta in North Africa? I mean, it's, a uh, or the, what are those islands called? The Balearics? Yeah. Yeah. Is so it one of them? On this, yeah, it's one of those. He's living in this little island. He's living in a windmill, right? 
Uh, he's, and windmill reminds us of Quixote, of course, right? Uh, Don Quixote. With the, so he's sort of quixotically living the whatever's left of his life in a kind of weird exile. He's sort of escaped, I suppose, the shadowy figures who are pursuing him in the States, right? Um, Klein, the lawyer who we'll talk about later, suggests that he tries to get a new identity and leave the country. Um, and so he ends up there at the end in a kind of spiritual exile, I suppose, right? Trying to pray in this desolate, abandoned windmill, I guess. Well, in this, in this sense, he differs from Llewellyn Moss in that he survives, you know? He, mm -hmm. he makes it. Right. We, at, at least, you know, at the end of the book, he's not dead. All right, so let's get into these characters who, as we said, are really the focus of the book. I mean, this is a book of fascinating characters that interact with each other in various ways. And we've we've talked about some of them already, but let's briefly review. We've got Bobby Western, who, as we say, is, you know, Western man, allegorically. Um, but then there's also that association with the genre of the Western that, that McCarthy is known for. So maybe there's some comment on that. But here are some uh, representative quotes. Someone, I guess it's Shedden, says yeah. this about him. He's in love with his sister and she's dead. I mean, if you had to, if you had to describe him in one sentence, that's it. Yeah, that's his curse. Right. Uh, his curse. He's cursed. Is, yeah, there's this the and there's that sort of incest curse notion, right? You know, uh, the impossible love, right? And, the love and again, consummated. And again, there's there's a, a Faulknerian theme, right? Like you think of Caddy and Quentin Compson. Um, Sound of the Fury, yeah. From the Sound and the Fury. Um, an incestuous relationship quasi incestuous well yeah right like i mean uh, i guess you could say psycho sexually or psycho spiritually mm -hmm. incestuous but uh you want to read the next one this is also john shedden talking about his friend bobby uh but he's a textbook narcissist of the closet variety and again that modest smile of his masks an ego the size of doubt no. so a little bit yeah different side of bobby and then i thought this was interesting western fully understood that he that he owed his existence to adolf hitler that the forces of history which had ushered his troubled life into the tapestry were those of auschwitz and hiroshima the sister events that sealed forever the fate of the west yeah. western west yeah. Yes. So he, in a way, he's like the last Western man, you know, like he represents right. the the end of Western man, the doom yeah. of Western and man. In, in classic McCarthy fashion, if he has a sort of masculine type of character, uh, he's stoic, laconic, you know, keeps his cards close, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he's not like a Quentin you know, uh, Compson, you know, kind of hysterical, falling to pieces. Drama queen. Right, 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 right. right. All right, I'll and, let you, uh, yeah, I'll I let know, you I'm, read the last one. When he tells uh, a visit, someone he runs into from his previous life, um, coincidentally runs into someone, the person's asking him what, what he does, he's in a windmill, he says, wow, and, uh, this, uh, what do you do, I pray. What do you pray for? I don't pray for anything. I just pray. So at the end, he is just trying to pray on some level. He's not praying for his health or for his sister or anything. He's just uh, praying in a state of kind of holy holiness, I suppose. So he's a monk, right? He's retreated from the world. Yeah, there's a kind of hopeless hope. Um, I think... Uh, Hawthorne said of Melville, he was not a believer, but he was never comfortable in his disbelief. Yeah, that, that typifies Western and perhaps McCarthy as well. Um, you know, the last sentence of the book uh, is he knew that 
on the day of his death, he would see her face, Alicia's face, and he could hope to carry that beauty into the darkness with him, the last pagan on earth singing softly upon his palate in an unknown tongue. So he's, beautiful. He's, he's, uh, he's praying at the end, but he's characterized here as the last pagan on earth, right? So he's not Christian, but he's, he's in some kind of state of eternal prayer. He's fixated still on his, he's, he's paying a kind of strange homage to his sister. I'm still trying to write letters to her. Well, there's a, I mean, you get the sense that the Christian is not really a Christian either. He's just a transformed pagan you know in mm -hmm. mccarthy's vision yeah like you can yeah. see if you go back it's a post, far it's enough post-christian world for sure right but and if you but this... if you can go back far enough you see that you you see the pagan roots of christianity like yeah. mccarthy is aware of the heaviness of that legacy you know it's not mm -hmm. it's not like there was a a clean break all of that all of those cultural accretions um, have survived and endured. Yeah. Um, as Faulkner said, the, the past is not dead. It's not even past. Right. All right. So then his sister, I, I've got this mnemonic picture here. Those uh, that are just listening, it's a picture of Tyler Perry's Madea, and I picked that um, a bit facetiously to represent her because it is when she is playing the part of Medea, the Greek Medea, that uh, her brother falls in love with her, right? Right. Yeah. And how old was she then? 14, I believe. Yeah. That's when he starts dating her, too. <clears throat> dating her, 14 or 16, maybe. That's elaborated further in Stella Maris, as you'll see. Oh, okay. Taking her out on the town and so on. Oh, my. I'm feeling uncomfortable. Someone's going to get canceled. <laughs> well, Someone's I'll, I'll going to get canceled. This, uh, <clears throat> I'll tackle this first one, right? Um, she knew in the end you can't really know. You can't get a hold of the world. You can only draw a picture. So... Her obsession with mathematics in particular, right? The, the idea that mathematical concepts and the concepts of physics can give you a representation, but you can't get past the representation of the world itself. Early on, in the very first scene of her hallucinations, the kid, who half the time seems to be speaking gibberish, and Alicia calls the kid on that, you're speaking gibberish, but then he'll say things like this. Uh, he says to Alicia, we know now that the continua don't actually continue. There ain't no linear, Bora. You just need to buckle down and do some by God calculating. That's where you come in. You got stuff here that is maybe just virtual and maybe not, but still the rules have got to be in it or you will tell me where the fuck are the rules located. So from the very beginning, the kid is tormenting her with these notions that plague her her entire life, these notions of unknowability you can't get a hold of the world you can only draw a picture she goes deep deep deep, deep into mathematics that's developed even further in Stella Maris right um, but this theme persists right this desire to understand uh, through representation right, through right, representation right. that word that when you said that it is exactly what I was thinking so what mm -hmm. is representation could be drawing a picture it could be writing a novel it could be right. you know formulating a mathematical or scientific theory it right. could be um you know uh writing a song or a symphony uh, symphony it's like therein lies a kind of redemption for these hopeless passengers right draw a picture you know paint something on a cave well, wall it's a redemption partly, but it's also a torment, right? Um, yeah, because well, of course. Alicia is tormented by the fact that you can't get a hold of the world, that you can't get to the well, metaphysical underpinning, right? You can only get to the phenomenological <laughs> sort of representation. Well, so is McCarthy, right? Like, yeah. he knows he knows that his books, beautiful as they are, are inadequate, right? Like, they... Yeah. It's like 
again, I think of Faulkner and, you know, his, his character, um, who was it? Um, one of those patriarchs that had his design, he called it a, a design, Sutton. right? But Sutton, Sutton. yeah. And in, it always uh, ends. Yeah. And it always ends in failure and disaster, mm-hmm. but it's the, yeah. it's the glory of the conception or, or I guess you could think of Beckett, right? Like, uh, try again, fail again, fail better. Or if not the glory, uh, the obsession <laughs> the driving you to, hmm. you know, make that representation. The, ne- the next two quotes are essentially establishing her as an alien, a fated creature, this death wish she has from the beginning, right? Yeah, and there's um, the... there's the She was never made for the world, right? Um, that she never really belonged, right? She There are a lot of sort of allusions to her being, again, some, almost a species distinct from the human, right? That comes up again and again and again. Well, she's demi-divine, like like Mary herself. Here's right. the age that you mentioned. She told me from the time she was about 14 that she was probably going to kill herself. We had long conversations about it. This is Bobby, obviously, her brother. Uh, they must have sounded pretty strange. She always won. She was smarter than me, a lot smarter. And the yeah. next one, I'll leave that one to you. Uh, she wanted to disappear. Well, that's not quite right. She wanted not to have ever been here in the first place. She wanted not to have been, period. And that's one of the inmates Bobby visits in Stella Maris. Right? So, uh, I think that's not I think just of... uh, Bobby's perspective, but when someone else's perspective, right? Yeah. Well, I think again of Beckett, you know, like everything that exists is a stain upon silence. I mean, he's he's talking about like writing and representation, but it could it could be existence itself, right? Like right. everything that is shouldn't be. Uh and then what else? I thought this was interesting. You didn't send me this, but I picked up on it. She tried to get into the place where they confined Rosemary Kennedy. Of course, Rosemary Kennedy was the the sister of uh, JFK that was lobotomized by her father. She ended up in a in a uh, an institution also in Wisconsin, but not the you know fictionalized right. Stella right. Morris. But th- there's kind of a the Kennedys are mentioned later. Um, in an interesting way, mm-hmm. but um, so we got the doomed, uh, the doomed Western siblings, which are the kind of heart of the novel, I suppose, right? Their troubled past, their father, right? Their love for each other, um, but to, but yeah. also like the daughter, I, I, I'm I'm um, focusing on this this quote about uh, Rosemary Kennedy because it's like the daughter is the scapegoat, you know, just as mm-hmm. Rosemary Kennedy was the family scape, mm. uh, scapegoat of the Kennedy family. Alicia is the family scapegoat of the Western family in a way. Yeah. Right. It's like she she takes upon the herself the sins of the world. Or the sins of the father, perhaps. The sins of the father. The theme that's yeah. uh, threaded through the through the novel, the sins of the father being upon the children. Right. Yeah. All right. And so let's see who's next. We've got the thalidomide kid. Um, This is the uh, character that doesn't even exist. Uh, He is hallucinated by Alicia and um, talks to her and entertains her. Thalidomide, I I didn't know this before, but it was a drug that was given to pregnant women and it caused serious birth defects. And so we assume from use in the early 60s. Um, Yeah, yeah, it caused congenital deformation, especially in the limbs. So here we have that quote, right? But Um, but we should still we should still trust Big Pharma, right? All right, so 
Here's what's said about him. This is a quote you picked out. He stopped to speak and thought better of it and paced again, kneading his hands before him like the villain in a silent film. Except, of course, they weren't really hands, just flippers, sort of like a seal has. So, yeah, he's... And he's got a keloidal skull, as we learn later. Yeah. Yeah, so very, um, you know, I guess you could say monstrous uh character at least in appearance mm-hmm. entertaining um sarcastic yeah. humorous intelligent yeah. Yeah. but uh, again a freak and of course you know he's maybe he too is emblematic of humanity we're all freaks in one way mm-hmm. or another some of us just are able to appear more normal than others and you know pretend that we're not um all accidental freaks and mistakes in Stella Stella Maris the book is just a series of transcribed conversations between the psychiatrist Alicia is talking to and Alicia and they speak at length about the kid right so there's a little bit more about him in that Mm -hmm. what Alicia feels about him and so on right yeah all right. Well, here is my favorite character. It is Long John Shedden. John Shedden. Yes. Yeah. Um. Here he is. This is one of my favorite quotes in the whole book. Uh, but I will tell you, Squire, he's talking to Western, he calls him Squire, that having read even a few dozen books in common is a force more binding than blood. What do you think about that, my literary brother in arms? That's right. It certainly speaks to people like us who have read a few dozen books in common, right? But um, yeah, there's a kinship here, right? Uh, This is probably the character that Shedden is the closest to. Uh, Maybe W.C. Fields. That Western is closest to. That Western is, yeah, excuse me, that uh, Western is closest to. Um, uh, At one point, Shedden says that he's a uh, or, or Bobby, I think, says that you're a man of words, I'm a man with number, right? Um, Shedden is uh, well-read, he's a ne'er-do-well, he's a thief, right? Um, he is... Uh, he's wanted the by the law, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. broke so, probation. Uh, right, 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 right. Um, uh, and he has a general cynicism about life, like the second quote i suppose that when a man is sick of pussy he's sick of life but i do think the bitches may have finally done me and god but we're fools um, i i take it back i take it back that's my favorite quote yeah <laughs> um but he and he and western are close he gives us a little bit of backstory about western and his sister he knew western from i think western's university days right so they've been friends for a long time it's a long abiding friendship uh, uh fantastic character I, w- I want to reread the book just for those sections with Shedden. I mean, he, to me, he is the most fascinating character in the novel. Yeah. And there, there's so many other quotes that we could have included here, but uh, the, this last one says, still at heart, I know there's more wisdom in sorrow yeah. than in joy. Yeah. The, the, that, uh, near the end of the book, Western gets a final letter from Shedden. Uh, and it has this quote, which is kind of related to that. Uh, Shedden writing unironically here. You know I, that I've always thought your history unnecessarily embittered. Suffering is a part of the human condition and must be born, but misery is a choice. Thank you for your friendship. In 20 years, I don't recall a word of criticism. And for this alone, deep blessings be upon you. Uh, so Beautiful. That that misery is a choice. That's this, you know, there's this little hint of criticism, like the misery that you're enduring because of your obsession with your dead sister. That's you're choosing that. And throughout the book, Shedden. But there's no presses. judgment. There's no judgment, there's no judgment there. But it's, he, he it's, is sort of he saying says like, it. Well, he says it with love, you know. This this misery is something that you've chosen, right? You are compounding your suffering further, right? But no, he says it with love and um, amor y respeto. Amor. There's also uh, uh, another passage earlier that I just want to point out before we move on. 
where he tells Bobby, I should have taken a page from your book. Die young for love and be done with it. Western says to him, I'm not dead. And then Shen replies, well, we won't quibble. <laughs> uh, but that's an implicit little criticism. Well, you kind of are dead, right? I mean, you're not, you closed yourself off to life. You're now basically a, a kind of weird monk devoted to your dead sister, right? Which is exactly how Shed, uh, Western ends up. But yeah, fantastic character. One of my favorites for sure. Yeah. Great, great. Uh, well, then we have Klein. Um, Why don't you tell, uh, explain briefly who Klein is. Well, you you referred to him as a lawyer. I wanted to say he was a private detective. Is it? Yeah, is he's he... a private detective. Yeah, he's a private detective. But he maybe he has a law degree. He certainly knows about the law and he has connections. I mean, who knows if his knowledge is reliable, but he knows a lot about some um, secretive underground shit involving organized crime and, you know, government cover-ups. Um, I I don't think I'm completely convinced by his his theory about the Kennedy assassination because he says you know it's stupid to think that the cia was involved or the cia did it i mean i don't know if he completely rules out involvement but you know as far as i'm concerned as far as i'm concerned there's there's not much distinction between organized crime and you know government intelligence agencies and other unsavory uh aspects of the american elite but as uh shedden says we won't quibble so uh this is this is what he says about they right he says they them these people that are after western they're not any smarter than they have to be and they're just as smart as they need to be they're just right and you're not and everyone's guilty. They don't even have to think about it. They are never in pursuit of the guiltless. I mean, what a hopeless prospect, right? Like, uh, you, you're never, you're never going to escape this. You're either going to end up dead or, um, imprisoned unless you change your identity and get the fuck out of here. Which is what he does at the end, right? Yeah, which is what um, he does. He takes the, the advice. Next quote, uh, you're not charged with anything. You're just under arrest. That's, I mean, textbook Kafka, the trial. That's how the trial begins. Yes. Right? So Klein is here to enunciate those Kafka-esque themes, right? That uh, the shadowy they, why is the IRS, why have they frozen my accounts, right? Why are they coming after me? Why aren't they arresting me? Why are they surveilling me? Right? Are they the ones who've wrecked my apartment? Right? All these unresolved questions. And Klein is there in these dialogues. Develop that idea, right? Um, yeah. Conspiracy, paranoia, etc. So it makes total sense that one of their later sections, Klein talks at great length about the Kennedy assassination. What greater, you know, example of conspiracy and paranoia in American history is there? Well, this is, and this is how it starts. Uh, we alluded earlier to. Uh, Western's comment that um, his sister, Alicia, tried to get into the same hospital where Rosemary Kennedy stayed, mm -hmm. right? And then this leads right. Klein to say, I worked with Bobby, meaning Bobby Kennedy, in Chicago mm -hmm. in the early 60s. And then we right. have 10 pages of his speculations on the JFK assassination. Fascinating stuff. I mean, it's kind of, it, so it sounds like, it sounds like uh, you know James Elroy's theory. Basically, it was organized crime, Carlos Marcello, and I don't know, maybe some Cuban uh, uh, expats. He doesn't really uh, Klein. That is, doesn't really focus on that Traficante connection and so on. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ba basically, he he suggests that it was you know a mob hit, but. Uh, Right. As as I've said, although it's fascinating to read, like you know, um and his his perspective is, is quite interesting. I mean, at least he, he knows that the Oswald 
uh, narrative is total bullshit. But um, I don't know. I, I, one of these days, I'm going to do an episode on um, um, James Douglas's book, JFK and the Unspeakable. So stay tuned for that. All right. Who's next? Debussy Fields. Now, I've got two mnemonic images here. There's uh, Claude Debussy, the composer, and then, do you get it? W.C. Fields. Did you notice that? So this is, this is um, Debbie, um, a trans woman, born male, but, you know, um, identifying as female and um she says of herself there is no god and i am she in this sense i mean i I just thought of this but is she is the reason why western i i mean does western sympathize with her and is he close to her because she's kind of like a surrogate alicia i mean does he does he see his sister in in Debbie, WC. Well, she's an incredibly sympathetic character. Uh, this is possibly my favorite part of the novel, this section with her where he meets her at a restaurant. She's be- described as a beautiful woman. You don't realize till a few pages in that, oh, this is a trans woman, right? And that's kind of the point, that she completely looks like a beautiful, well-kept woman, etc. Um we learn that she has a little sister whom she loves very dearly. And that's, I think, you know, just uh, Western loves his sister, W.C. Field loves hers. But um, yeah, Western has nothing but, I mean, that last quote, you know, where he thought that God's goodness appeared in strange places. Don't close your eyes. He's, there's a little, if Western has any faith, it's faith in, uh, the way in which humanity can take unexpected forms. Uh, and she is one of those people who allows him to feel that faith in God's goodness, right? Um, it's a beautiful portrait. It's incredibly moving, right? Uh, and it certainly, I think, belies the notion that Western can only write from a male point of view. McCarthy. Excuse me, that's what I meant. McCarthy, right. right yeah. Right. So well, second quote. He said he said something in an interview before his death that he had been thinking about a female character. Maybe he's talking about Alicia, mm-hmm. but could be W.C. Fields too. For years, like I think he he'd been planning this novel for a couple of decades, right? Like he, it wasn't until the end of his mm-hmm. life that he felt he could he could um, accurately portray this female character. So. What a great right. achievement. But yeah, read the next quote for us. Um, well, that first quote is, if there's no God, I am she, the notion that I can remake myself. Uh, the second quote, I want to have a female soul. I want the female soul to contain me. That's what I want. That's all I want. I thought that it might be always out of my reach, but now I've started to have faith. That's what I pray for when I pray. So here's <laughs> someone else who has, is praying the way that Western is at the end, right? Um, wanting to have a female soul. She's hard, starting to have faith in that. Um, yeah, it's a confessional moment. Uh, she clearly trusts Bobby to speak this way. Remember that later when Bobby leaves, before he leaves for Spain, he entrusts her with yes. Alicia's letters to him. Yeah. Um, uh, he has her read the them he because to. he can't do it himself. Right, right. He the can't bring one, himself to do it. It's the la- yeah. He he he's read them. He hasn't read the last letter, and he has her read the last. Letter, yeah, yeah. Right? So well, so right, she, uh, right. He not all not, not all of them. He can't he's read, read the and last. Memorized one. all the others by heart. Right? Yes, there uh, you but go. The last one he's never let himself read. So she's hugely important to Western, uh, and she's she's depicted in uh, incredibly sympathetic fashion. Yeah, and uh, you. Um, referred to a couple of lines in this last quote. He watched her until she was lost among the tourists, men and women alike turning to look after her. He thought that God's goodness appeared in strange places. Don't close your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. In, in her portrait, she tells of her own backstory and her abusive father. And 
the way that she came out to her mother, it's kind of comic, right? He yeah. Says her mama, try not to think of it as losing a son. Try to think of it as gaining a freak. And then she really went to bawling. Uh, but then her sister looks at her, right? Uh, and the sister says, William, is that you? You're beautiful. And yeah. I busted out bawling. God, I love that child, right? So the sister accepts her immediately calls mm -hmm. her beautiful right um in a way that the mom can um yeah really moving um something i hadn't seen before and i hadn't seen a character like this in any of his fiction that line i want the female soul to contain me i mean that's got to be related to alicia in some way too and mm -hmm. and western right like maybe that's what what he wants um mm -hmm through the connection with his sister and, yeah. um, you know, Mary, Stella Maris. Mm -hmm. It's the feminine archetype, the goddess. Right. Right. All right, well, Euler is a somewhat minor character, but, uh, you know, he's a confidant of uh, Western. Um, and he he's with him when um they first discover the um wreckage right but yeah. unlike western he wants nothing to do with it he says i'll tell you what else i think that my desire to remain totally fucking ignorant about shit that will only get me in trouble is both deep and abiding i'm going to say that it is just damn near a religion. Yeah. Yeah, he's the Vietnam veteran, right? Um, and and what does he say section. about that experience? Well, Bobby kind of interrogates him late in a later scene where they're sitting around drinking and just asks him, it's the kind of stuff you would never ask a veteran, you know? Tell me about your, your worst memory. Tell me about the thing that terrified you the most. Um, and so Bobby's there, like pushing him, pushing him, pushing him to um, speak more about his war experiences, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the second quote, I think, you know, is one of the things that Euler talks about. You go to war, you're not really mad at anybody. You're just trying to keep alive long enough to learn how to stay that way. It's only when you start to see a few of your buddies get wasted that you really eat a hard on for those sons of bitches. The reason I signed up for a second tour was try to get even that's all nothing complicated about it so these depictions of warfare why men go to war why they how they get engaged in warfare right um, and it's certainly a kind of commentary on the vietnam war right um, all these young boys being thrown into this unjust war seeing their friends get killed and the idea that they then develop a kind of bloodlust out of vengeance right um, yeah uh yeah, then and he, uh... and and even though that's appalling, we sympathize with him in a way because he recognizes it and owns it, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he's so he, you know, he's a victim himself in a way. He's just a dumb kid that got drafted and didn't have a daddy that let him go to the Coast Guard to get out of it, you know. Right, right. I think I misquoted right. the. That first one, I'm not finding it on page 26, so I'm going to have to well, fix I think that. Well, our editions have different, we have different editions. That's Do we? Why. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, Shit. Yeah, I'm, I'm, some of the page numbers you have listed are not, I don't think they coincide. Oh, my. Okay. I didn't realize so, that. Well, I'm going to have to, like, like I'm going to have to fix that. that. Oiler's dead, diving <laughs> accident down in Venezuela. I guess yeah. your edition is 229. Mine is like a page 118. Oh, interesting. Because I'm looking here, right? Euler's sudden death is delivered by his friend Lou. He says, sorry, Bobby, Euler's dead. No other way to say it. That's on page 118. Well, uh, diving accident. Was it an accident or was he taken out by these <clears throat> mysterious forces that are pursu well, pursuing Western, Western? Western says, don't pay attention to me. They'll bury him at sea. You watch. He won't be coming home. So Western... Western's paranoia makes him think that it wasn't an accident. Right? I didn't think so. it was an accident. But that's another one. We never know what happens, right? Is this a novel where Western tries to investigate what happened to his friends and we discover what happened to Euler and there's a shadowy 
We don't get those answers. No, you never know. <clears throat> it's always unresolved. But I think, you know, our suspicions are certainly justified. Do you have your edition there? Like what the... Uh, how, not how, immediately on me. I've got my notes here. Is it as thick as this around. or is it a more well, slender volume? It seems like you have fewer last, pages. What's your last page? My last page is 437. <laughs> Oh, so yours is a thicker volume. Mine is 383. No. Okay, uh, well, uh, sorry about that, people. The page numbers are going to be all over the place. Some are from my edition, and some are from my guest's edition. So you'll just have to figure that out. I think I misquoted um, this uh first excerpt here it should say something like i'm gonna say that it is just about damn near a religion right that's probably what that should say oh well yeah, um maybe that's all right let, let's matter. see uh, Who's next? another minor character grand ellen this is uh you know bobby and Alicia's grandmother she says i don't know bobby you have to believe that there's good in the world i'm going to say that you have to believe that the work of your hands will bring it into the world you may be wrong but if you don't believe that but if you don't believe that then you will not have a life you may call it one but it won't be one it's kind of like she's taking the uh pascalian wager right like uh, you may as well bet on the fact that there is a god because if if there's not, you don't lose anything. But if there is, you lose everything, right? Yeah, and I find this character also very, very sympathetic. Um, this is the maternal grandmother still living in Tennessee. He goes and visits her. Um, <clears throat> she loves him and loved Alicia as well without understanding them, right? There's a kind of intellectual gulf between them. But uh, I, I see her just simply as a way to humanize bobby right bobby has almost no familial connections left except with this woman and he thinks you know that soon soon he won't even have this right because she's near the end of her life it is interesting that she says if you don't believe you have to believe that there is good in the world right um and to bobby's credit he does right uh when he thinks about Debussy, right? That's exactly the language he uses, right? About God's goodness manifesting itself in unexpected places. So um, he's not completely bereft of that faith that Grant Ellen says is absolutely necessary to have a life. Interestingly, the the mother of Bobby and um, Alicia is the second wife of the father, right? Like he had a a previous um, relationship, apparently no kids. So we, yeah. I had the sense that he was like older. And then he, while working at the, uh, the lab there in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, he, he just stumbled upon a local beauty. Grant Ellen yeah. says something like, I knew when he came, to our house that our lives would change. Right, right. And there's right, there's right. she says something about beauty and like the 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 trouble that it can bring and like the mother was a beauty and then she gave birth to a beautiful daughter who ends up committing suicide. She and says, what happened? Uh, beauty. What? Yeah. She I've got the quote. She says beauty makes promises that beauty can't keep. I've yeah. Too many I've seen it too many times, twice in this house. Twice in this house. Now, what happened to the mom? She died of cancer or something? Yeah, she died of cancer, uh, probably from her uh, exposure to some... Poisoning and so on. Yeah, exposure to some shit. In in a chat with Bobby says, do you think this family has a curse on it? Mm -hmm. Uh, Western says, what? Like the sins of the father. So... um, that certainly connects with Grant Ellen's sense that as soon as I saw your father, I knew that things were doomed, right? And She's kind of like, with, go ahead. The doom is obviously connected with, you know, the advent of the atomic age. Right? Well, yeah, I was just going to say, she's kind of like someone who 
um, doesn't understand this modern world, this atomic age. Right. She's like from a previous generation, almost a previous species, you know, like she's a right. dying breed, kind of like, uh, you know, what's the sheriff's name? Ed Tom Bell in No right. Country for Old Men. It's like, what what is this new world that we've, um, you know, gotten ourselves right. into like this is right. it's no longer a human world it's a it's a world of monsters there's no humanity um yeah. it's a post apocalyptic world like that of the road you know it's like mm -hmm. there's a hard rain are gonna fall yeah yeah there's yeah. that there's that i don't know mccarthy-esque sense of impending doom and and apocalypse and there's no going back and we're fucked yeah so yeah. you know you better just make Buckle what in. you can of it yeah pray if you want to probably won't do any good but can't hurt maybe right right all right then we've got lurch a very minor character we only mention him because he took the pipe meaning he uh, committed suicide, right? Yeah, he's he's in the room that Western moves into after he vacates his apartment because it's being surveilled, I think, right? Am I, am I remembering that right? Yeah, and what does he do? So, he sucks on some poison fumes? I think so, but the more important thing is that the woman who lets him inhabit Lurch's room says that the last few inhabitants in that room have committed suicide so it's sort of a, a cursed room a cursed that room is moving that bobby is moving into right? yeah and i suppose he escapes the curse by by the end and fleeing for fleeing the uh continent right um yeah and ending up in the windmill right but yeah that is the notion that he is a marked man from the very beginning right mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, and finally, we have the character Billy Ray, and it's not Miley Cyrus's father. Rather, it is a cat. It's not even a human character. You, I included this slide because you, I don't know, you, you told me that you liked the fact that Western was a cat lover what well i'm, I'm a cat i'm a cat man myself so I'm, okay I'm, I'm sympathy for that but it is the last being he allows himself to live with and connect with and it's kind of heartbreaking later when the cat is lost right after someone ransacks his house he wanders the streets of new orleans with the open cat food and he's clicking the fork against the can and there's a kind of McCarthy-esque image out of the road about being like a mendicant with his bowl, clicking on his bowl, looking for his lost cat. So, mm. Yeah, I just pulled at my sentimental heartstrings. And that speaks to the sadism of these shadowy, you know, probably government-affiliated characters, right? Like they fucking take his cat. You know, or just let the cat, the or cat let the escape. Yeah, let the cat yeah, escape, or, or who knows? Maybe they knows? skinned it. Maybe they killed it. You know, because they're <laughs> such fucking savages with no humanity. They just right, belong right, to right. a world of officialdom and rule following, and um, this dystopian Kafka esque, uh, Kafka esque, nightmarish post atomic world you know west the yeah. western world is doomed like uh auschwitz and hiroshima sealed its fate and there's there's been no going back right right all right well all uh right. how would you we always have to rank these books right like we use the five star system so if we were writing a review on amazon or good goodreads or bookbub what would you give this book? Uh, let's see. I, I never formally rate books in terms of online reviews, but I don't know, maybe a 4.5. I found it pretty enthralling, right? Uh, it was it's kind of a sprawling mess. It's definitely not for everybody. Well, I certainly understand how some would not like this book at all. But again, if you're looking for a clean plot and resolved mysteries, don't read it, right? Yeah. Uh, but again, I, I think it's a kind of glorious sprawl, which is, you know, 
I hope we've conveyed a way in which it seems thematically gelled together, right? I loved it. I mean, I, I did post something on Goodreads because I it's just a good site to keep record of what I'm mm-hmm. reading. And you don't have, like, partial stars, so I just gave it five, which I think mm-hmm. is, it was amazing. I mean, I would say it's canonical. Uh, McCarthy, to me, is a canonical writer. I think this is a great book. It's, it's, uh, I would you know, say if you've read if you've read McCarthy and you like McCarthy, you should read this book. There's no doubt about that, right? Yeah. Um, oh, absolutely. I, I just, it's his last masterpiece, his last statement. I mean, in addition to Stella Maris. Yeah. So yeah, McCarthy fans will definitely want to read it, and uh, that leads us to Stella Maris, which is the next volume in this so-called duology. Went looking for a copy of it today here in Taipei and did not find it in the local bookstore. So I'm going to order it. You've already finished it, you say. Will you come mm-hmm. back and discuss that with us after I read it? Yeah, we we definitely should. It's a shorter book too, right? Um, yeah. Uh, just under 200 pages uh, and it works as a coda. Yeah. For sure. And we get to know Alicia much, much better. Mm-hmm. So, yes, happy to come back for that. Great. And uh, we just want to remind everyone again, uh, G.J. Via and I uh, wrote, co-wrote Flans Day, which is volume one of the Aaronesque series of novelettes, um, just as, uh, you know, McCarthy has a connection to Irish literature, our series of novelettes does as well. Uh, James Joyce was a great influence on McCarthy, and he is the uh, inspiration behind this series of novelettes. Um, Flans Day deals also with the great Irish author Flan O'Brien. So get your copy at Amazon and get ready for volume two, which is called Wilds Day. And as you might guess, um, that focuses on the work of Oscar wild another great irish author and all right don't forget to subscribe to my newsletter at mark will write that's w-r-i-t-e dot substack dot com and uh follow me on youtube as well you can subscribe to my channel that's also at mark will write w-r-i-t-e so thanks again everyone And uh, we'll see you next time when we discuss Cormac McCarthy's Stella Morris. This has been our discussion of Cormac McCarthy's The Passenger. It's a great one. Be sure to read it and let us know what you think in the comments. Until next time, farewell.